Great. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me to speak today. So since uh, early 2000, I've been working with a team of economists and other experts on strategies to accelerate vaccination, end the COVID-19 pandemic sooner, and prepare for future pandemics. And uh, you'll see a couple of references on the slides um, that I'll draw on today. The world developed and manufactured COVID-19 vaccines at an unprecedented pace, but still not fast enough. Many countries still face a long delay before they can expect widespread vaccination. Shortages of vaccines have caused damaging export restrictions and hoarding. For future pandemics, we can avoid these problems by investing in advance to create sufficient production capacity for vaccines, for stronger supply chains, and better incentives for research and development. I think these, many of these lessons are for, are our focus today on lessons for pandemic preparedness in the future, but there may still be scope for faster, uh, or faster ways to address this pandemic. Let me start out with some background. You know, historically, most vaccine candidates fail. You know, there's a, very few of them succeed. And installing vaccine production is very difficult and expensive. You know, they're very different from uh, typical drugs, treatments, where it's small molecules. For vaccines, there's a saying in the industry that the process is the product. What's licensed is actually the individual factory. Every step in the production process needs its own uh, quality control tests that have to be individually approved. So they're very long production times. You know, typically, prior to this pandemic, constructing new vaccine capacity would take years, and even repurposing existing capacity uh, can take on the order of six months. In fact, as late as October 2020, there was a very nice survey of experts, and they, they thought that we would have to wait until 2021 for an approved vaccine, and that we'd only have 115 million doses by the end of 2021. Now, another thing to, uh, let me switch over to the economic analysis. Manufacturing capacity is extremely valuable to society during a pandemic. At one level, that's obvious. At another level, I think we haven't sufficiently appreciated that basic fact. The IMF estimates costs of the pandemic, even aside from the enormous health costs and education costs, just GDP losses at $500 billion every month. That implies a huge social value of additional capacity. You know, we estimated that additional capacity as of early 2021 would have been worth $1,400 per additional course that could be produced per year. But there are totally understandable and inevitable social and political and ethical limits on pricing during the pandemic. And hence, the prices right now are in the range of 6 to $40 per course. And what that means is that while there may be very good reasons for limits on prices, the private commercial incentives to install capacity to, do early, to make those very early, very risky investments, very expensive investments, and to do so at sufficient scale will not match the social needs. And therefore, there's a case for government intervention to incentivize very early and very large-scale capacity installation. So early in this pandemic, you know, uh, here's a site in New York Times, uh, a piece that uh, we put out, but I think you know, others were also in, in, uh, uh, advocating similar strategies. You know, we suggested, based on some analysis, governments should pay to install capacity to produce enough vaccines for their full population for each of 15 to 20 vaccine candidates. Why so many? because you need lots of shots on goal because most candidates fail. It turned out we got lucky and, and we had a lot of successes in this case. Um, but we, you know, from, a, from the perspective when we don't know, it's worth, taking, it's worth doing a lot of investment just because it's so valuable um, to, to have the vaccines. 
What we suggested was that governments pay to install that capacity in exchange for companies agreeing to sell successful vaccines once they got through the clinical trials at a pre-specified price. The benefit of this is that it allows the capacity installation at very large scale to occur in parallel with testing rather than after uh, testing. What did governments do? Well, there was substantial investment in expanding vaccine production through advanced contracts, but there wasn't enough. So just to give you a sense of this, you know, the, the US and UK in particular made large investments. If we think about Operation Warp Speed in the US, you know, that was a $13 billion investment. You know, we actually suggested larger scale investments, but um, if we just take what was done, we calculate that that would have paid for itself if it ended the pandemic just 12 hours sooner. These, these, it's, it's impossible. You know, this is, in the words of one of my co-authors, the world's e easiest cost-benefit calculation. Um, it's, it's um, you know, the, the value of doing this, it's worth spending a lot of money on. Um, it was very successful relative to earlier expectations. You know, 1.7 billion doses have already been delivered far more than people, than experts thought would be possible. But despite that, more investment would have been, been optimal. Uh, there's not enough, you know, we haven't delivered things rapidly enough, and it looks like there'll be long delays for many countries. And we still estimate very large value of capacity. In fact, you know, we would suggest that it would make sense to take proposals now, even so late in the game, uh, for additional capacity, and um, and be willing to pay for uh, things that have a have a reasonable chance, even a, a, a su some chance of success. Okay, let me. What are some lessons of this for for future pandemics? Well, you know, during this pandemic, shortages constrained capacity expansion, and that means that we should invest now in sufficient standby capacity for both the vaccines and for the inputs into the vaccine process. And that's partly you know, standby capacity, standby factories for vaccines that would be ever ready. Um, for inputs, we need both standby capacity and stockpiles. And we need enough to rapidly vaccinate the world using each of multiple vaccine candidates. So this, this means you know, several times over. Doing that would be highly cost effective, even if there's only a small risk of a, pan, of a future pandemic. And I think, critically, it's not only cost-effective, but it promotes equity. And the basic logic for that is if you have a, a, a queue, a line that's waiting for two years, you cut the speed of that in half, you, cut, you have enough capacity to cut that, that time in half. Well, that's a small benefit for, the, for those of us who are in the front of the line. But for those of us who are in the back of the line, that's cutting the, the queue from two years to one year. And that's enormously valuable. I think that this could also reduce incentives for vaccine nationalism. So during a vaccine shortage, you know, governments have very strong incentives to vaccinate their own population first, to put on export bans, to hoard vaccines in case there are problems or they need booster shots or they want to vaccinate uh, children. And, you know, if we just rely on moral persuasion, that hasn't been sufficient to solve the problem uh, this time. It's important, but it's not sufficient on its own. And I think we need to think ahead for, the, for future pandemics. Because if governments think they're going to have to rely on their own production, they, if, every, if every country relies on domestic or even regional production, that's going to be extremely risky. We got lucky this time, and many vaccines succeeded. But imagine that only one vaccine had succeeded. That's the historical record suggests that would have been a more likely outcome. Well, in that case, you know, it's going to be very important to draw on production from the whole world. And of course, the supply chains go over the whole world as uh, as the as the, the uh, as as we see with these mRNA vaccines. I think we need both national efforts to do that. I don't think we need to. I don't in in the COVID pandemic. There might have been some tension between national and global efforts. Um, you can argue the case either way, but it's hard to expand capacity a lot in the short run. 
And therefore, there might have been some, some extent to which certain national efforts, you know, we don't know if they, if they didn't expand production at all, then they would have, then they would have drawn from other countries. If they expanded the total envelope, they might have helped. You can debate this either way. But it's a very different situation if we're preparing for future pandemics. Preparing for future pandemics, we have, we have time. And that means that over, over time, this capacity, we can expand production capacity. So national and global efforts can actually be complementary. We need both. And obviously, we need global efforts for low and middle income countries. But, we are, but national efforts don't necessarily come at the expense. I also think we need to rethink um, our, our approaches for incentivizing innovation. And you know, one good thing that comes out of crises is new approaches and new technologies. You know, we're using uh, video conferencing right now. Well, there are all, there's also been advances in how we incentivize innovation. So patents play a very important role in incentivizing R&D by granting monopoly rights. But the tension is that the way they do that is that you, they reward the inventor through monopoly rights, and monopoly rights reduce access. If we could find, we need to preserve and, in fact, enhance this function of incentivizing R&D, but to do it in a way that doesn't endanger access. How can you do that? Well, I think we've, we, had a, we had some experience prior to this pandemic, but during this pandemic, we saw a strategy that was very successful as far as it went, should have done more of it, which was advanced contracting. And the advanced contracting incentivizes R&D not by, not, you know, maybe they have monopoly rights from patents, maybe they don't, you could do it either way. But the key aspect of the advanced contracting is that you reward access as well as innovation by specifying the quantity or the capacity and the price and then promising to reward companies if they produce enough for the full population. So that was an important strategy of what, what worked for, uh, uh, for COVID-19. A previous example was the advanced market commitment for pneumococcus, um, which led to the much, ra much more rapid, uh, the development of much more rapid rollout of pneumococcus vaccine for low and middle income countries. That, that was a uh, number of countries pledged $1.5 billion for it. You know, it's estimated the pneumococcus vaccine has saved 700,000 lives. Uh, I think this is an approach we should think about using in the future. But let me uh, conclude with something that um, is both a recommendation for the future, but also something that uh, you know, the relevant authorities might want to consider now. So if we had adaptive trials, and if we looked at dose stretching uh, approaches, um, that, and I'll describe that in a minute, that could enable us to vaccinate populations much faster. So in particular, it makes sense to look at a wide range of dosing strategies. For example, first doses, first policies like the UK used, but also different levels of dosing. So just to give you a sense of the potential, in 2016, Brazil was, uh, was dealing with a yellow fever outbreak. With the support of the WHO, they decided to use one-fifth doses. So that can obviously expand the supply you know, potentially fivefold. That worked for Brazil. Now, the problem is that the incentives to explore the uh, multiple doses don't match the social value, which is obviously immense. Let me show you some, some you know, very, um, you know, I, I, this is far from dispositive evidence. I want to emphasize that. But I think it nonetheless illustrates the potential. So what this graph shows is the, um, if you think, if you look at the circles with the squares inside them, those, that's, that's the vaccines, the status quo doses. The horizontal axis shows the immune response. The vertical axis shows the efficacy as measured in phase three trials. You'll see that this is a very good predictor, uh, that the immune response you know, predicts the uh, efficacy very well. Okay, now, we, for the for lower doses, we have some trial, some information on immune response, but not we haven't got undergone these large scale trials. So those are the points. You know, we've 
t fitted the curve, taken other work that's fitted the curve, and we've plotted the efficacy of partial doses. So take a look at, for example, Moderna at the top. So the green uh, circle with the square inside is the status quo dose. If you look at the, uh, if you went with half dose, you can see that it's virtually identical in terms of immune response. The predicted efficacy, if you went from this graph, would be uh, would be 95%. Okay? Even if you go to a quarter dose, you have very high, uh, high efficacy. That, to the extent we have this type of immune response data, it suggests that we could potentially have very high efficacy from, from cutting uh, doses in half or even in a quarter. Similar things with uh, Pfizer, um, you know, maybe a bit less so, but similar with AstraZeneca. You know, it, this is something that for future pandemics, we should incentivize people to explore. You know, for this pandemic, look, this is a decision for uh, medical experts and national regular, regulatory authorities, not for economists like me. But I think what we can say is more, you know, some may decide to go ahead, just like the UK did, without efficacy data, with first doses first. You know, that worked out. There are risks in that approach. You know, countries will have to decide that on their own. But I think what is very clear is that getting more information on this um, through, and the initial steps could be done with just trial immune response measures with hundreds of patients in a matter of weeks, that that's immensely valuable for society. So I think for future pandemics, we should do this, and the appropriate authorities should decide whether we do this right now for uh, COVID-19. Thanks very much.